want to be respectful of everyone's time. And I want to begin by thanking all of you for welcoming us into the Shamrock Zone as part of Cash Unite. I thought this year we would do something a little different. And we know that there are multiple generations on our campus. We know that there's multiple generations across the United States. There are the lost generation, there's the baby boomers, there's generation X, generation Y, which are the millennials, there's generation Z, that's our current student population. There's also generation alpha that are between the ages of zero and 10. Those are students that are going to transition to Kansas State University eventually. Sometimes they come on our campuses in the summertime for different activities, workshops, etc. Today, I bring you greetings from the Office of the President as well as the Office of Direct Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. And again, we're honored and delighted that you could join us today. So we put together, together a panel presentation called Generational Perspectives on DEIB, Generation X, Generation Y, and Generation Z. And we wanted to hear from athletes, those that work with athletes, but we wanted to get a cross-perspective overview regarding different individuals' ways of thinking about DEIB as it relates to athletics. So I'm going to go down the panel, this line, and I would like for each of our panelists to introduce yourselves, please. Good afternoon, my name is Dr. Vera White, and in the compliance office. I've been at K-State since 2000, 2000. And so it's been quite a long time. And I graduated from K-State with my PhD and my master's. And it's great to be here and welcome. Okay, good morning everyone, or good afternoon. My name is Daisy Money. I am a junior here at K-State. I'm on the track and field team. My major is psychology with a minor in human resources, and I'm happy to be here. Hello, hello everyone. My name is Monique Hardy. I am a junior here also on the track and field team. My major is life sciences with a minor in psychology, and yeah, I'm very happy to see a lot of familiar faces here, and so excited to speak with y'all. Hi everyone, my name is Brie Lowe. I am a fifth year on the track and field team. I am a graduate student getting my master's in gerontology. And yeah, I'm excited to be here. My name is Dave Baker. <coughs> I played baseball here at K-State in 1966. I was the head baseball coach from 1977 to 84. And uh, I'm still a great, uh, K-State alumni and, and supporter and just happy to be here. Hi everyone, my name is Regina and I'm the Director of Social Media and Digital Strategy here at K-State. And I've been here a little over a year now, but um, both of my parents went here, so it's kind of feels like home a little bit too. Can you hear me? What comes to mind immediately when you hear or see the word diversity? Are we just going to go down the line yeah. again? Um, for me, when I hear the word diversity, I think of, well, the first thing usually what comes to mind is race, but there's a lot of other things that include are included in diversity that's religion uh, gender so many other things um, but with that it's all of those different things coming together in one space to be who they truly are without feeling different um, even though you are different diversity to me means everything everything that we can think of is diverse people things and it's just a very simple word. Nothing is the same, so we have to treat everything different. So that is diversity to me. Um, diversity to me is definitely differences and celebrating those differences, whether it's race, religion, or age. For me, my perspective on um, diversity is more on the generational side with um, 
my area of study, uh, but it's all about celebrating the differences between all of us and coming together uh, as one unit. Diversity means to me um, a different, I guess the same as what everyone says, but um, different mindsets, different backgrounds, different religion, culture, and so much more coming together in one space to basically accomplish one common goal. Okay, just to piggyback off of what Monique just said, I feel like um, usually, I mean, at first, whenever I thought diversity, at first I would think race, but now like in the year that we're in and like the age that we're in, 2023, I feel like it can include gender, identity, culture, generation, just everything, knowing that even if somebody looks the same as you, we're different in our own way. So everyone being unique and then just coming together as a community. Great response. She took mine, actually. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, look at it from a different perspective. Now that I'm getting older, I used to see diversity uh, being a baby boomer from a uh, race and ethnic perspective. But now as I get older, I see it from an age perspective and a generational perspective because growing older and having all of the new people come in from Gen X, millennials, and all of that, I'm having to learn about these new generations and how they operate. And as a uh, adjunct professor, how they communicate and how they learn. So that's one thing. And another thing too is from an age perspective is the way we pr present things. A lot of times young people present things because their vision is perfect, but older people can't see anything. So I just want to throw in this, that if you're doing something and you're inviting an older crowd, remember us who can't see anything. So you talked a little about diversity and what it means from each of your perspectives. How many of you are on social media? How many of our audience members are on social media? So does diversity look different on social media? And we have multiple perspectives here as well as participants in the audience. What does social media have to do with diversity? Anyone? Um, diversity on social media looks different for everybody because people use social media for different platforms, different uses, whether it be for K-State Athletics promoting our athletes, whether it be a personal Instagram account or social media um, to where you promote yourself or businesses promoting whatever, you know, they're trying to achieve so. or community service as well, serving your community and making sure that, you know, everybody gets to see what you're promoting, so. Thank you. I think social media, um, as far as social media, media is concerned, those who are developing the platforms, they have to keep in mind uh, the perspective of trying to include and incorporate things for people from different ages, races, ethnicities, uh, gender, gender orientations. So especially when it, they're trying to uh, sell a product, they can't just uh, have that product go out to one particular group of people. So they have to uh, elaborate that platform so it encompasses everybody. Thank you. Okay. Um, Social media, I feel like in this day and age is very big, and I feel like it can be a very good concept if it's used the right way. For example, like um, let's say me and Mo, we're in the same we're in the same sport, but if we're both posting about our sport, we're posting about ourselves, and we're, it's like a way to you know showcase ourselves and like just show everyone who we are. I know a lot of times there's a negative light on social media, but like I said, if it's used in the proper way, I feel like. It's a good way to really express who you really are within, especially if you can't, you know, express it to others, like in person. It's a way for people to see like, oh, that's who Daisy is. Oh, that's who Monique is. That's that's what she likes to do on her, just, you know, because everyone is unique and everyone is different. So it's just, I feel like it's a way to, you know, showcase and really show who you really are. 
Thank you. I know that many of you serve dual roles as students, as athletes, as former athletes, retirees, workers at Kansas State University. Can you talk a little bit and can you provide some examples, please, about how you know you feel included at Kansas State University? How do you know that you're included? What does inclusion look like for you? Can you provide some examples? Um, I think for me, it's about having multiple different spaces to express myself. So I'm involved in a lot of different areas um, on campus, whether that be in athletics, in my sport, um, in SAC for athletics, for those of you, SAC is Student Athletic Advisory Committee. It's somewhat of a student council um, and student, repre student athlete representatives. Um, also, I'm a graduate teaching assistant on campus. I work in the Center on Aging. So it's just about having um, different spaces to express different parts of yourself um, that all make up your own diversity. Kansas State University is a big university. And if you are a part of it, it's, it's like a big family. And athletics is, uh, is just one part of that uh, uh, big university and f I grew up here in Manhattan Kansas so I've kind of know what it feels like being in the community versus being here at this university and uh, once you become part of this university it just feels like you are special and and people treat you different so living in Manhattan Kansas uh, I can definitely tell you there's a difference being on this campus versus just being in the community so um, if you are part of this university and part of any part of this university, you feel like it's part of your family and it makes you feel good. You feel like you're, you're really a part of something and that's something that uh, we all would like to have in our lives, I think. And uh, I know I've, I've experienced that here since I've, even though I'm not coaching, I'm still part of Kansas State University and it all started way back when. Um, I played soccer at a different university and my experience was similar to Bree where I got to get involved in many different spaces outside of just athletics and I think as a staff member here it's very similar where we have groups just for staff that we can go to um, with like happy hours outside of just athletics and people getting to know each other and then we have groups um, getting together to go to games and stuff like that and you can get involved with SAC and other entities outside of athletics, um, just whatever you feel uh, you, you want to express yourself in, kind of like Bree said, but it's not only for the student athletes, but for the staff as well. So that's a good way to feel like included and you can pick what you want to be a part of and they welcome you and it's a great feeling. <laughs> okay, so for me, being inclusive in, I guess, on campus and athletics. Immediately when I got here, I got super involved. I was able to get involved with BSU. I was able to join a Black Greek organization. I got involved with PALS and more affinity groups within athletics, as well as being a student athlete here. So like Bree said, is being involved in so many different places and where you feel included and comfortable in. I felt comfortable in all of these different places within you know, Kansas State University and the athletics and academics portion of it. Um, the ways that I felt included was just being so welcomed, like here is such a family compared to where I was. Um, and I was able to really just dive into these places comfortably, knowing that I'd be accepted, knowing that I'd, you know, be loved for who I am and not, oh, you need to fit into this category or this box or anything like that, so. Okay, so for me, this question like is very important to me. Um, not a lot of people know this, but I did just transfer here to K-State. I have not been here all my years of college. So um, just feeling included and stuff, that was something that I was very like scared and worried about. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to a new school. Like I'm scared. But as soon as I got here, everybody opened me, like welcomed me with open arms. And that's something that has really resonated. And that's probably my favorite thing about K-State is like, the community within K-State and like the fact that the people are for you. And I feel like each and every, I don't know if it's a Midwest thing or a K-State thing, but I feel like each and every person here at K-State has really welcomed me and made me feel like home. Like I'm from 
South Texas and I'm not used to, you know, Kansas or the weather and stuff, but just like talking to people and people make me feel like, Daisy, you know, I'm here for you, Daisy, um, I got you. Like with everything within my sport, within my coaches, within BSU, shout out our president and vice president who are here supporting. Um, within just organizations and everyone on campus, um, I felt very welcome and I think um, K-State does a really good job including people, especially people that are new, like me. And older people too. <laughs> uh, being included to me is being able to attend events and functions and not feel that you're left out. And sometimes when we work at a place where you are a um, minority perspective it, uh, when it comes to a population, because it's not many, um, there's sometimes a reluctance to want to go things to different events because no one looks like you. But one of the things that I can say here is that although a lot of times I am maybe one of the few people of color, I've never felt excluded. And I've always been accepted to go into different places and to do different things. Sometimes I could be a little bit cantankerous in a way, and they might want to exclude me, but they accept me anyway. Can you talk, can you talk briefly about what inclusion looks like in our external community outside the walls of Kansas State University? Does that inclusion that I heard you mention, I heard the word family and embracing and unity, KS Unite. So what does inclusion look like outside of the walls of Kansas State University? I think since Manhattan is a very, not super small town, but very oriented around the school and around athletics, I think that it still radiates outside of the school. Everyone's for K-State and if when I go somewhere and I just went to Hy-Vee yesterday and told them that I worked for the athletic department and they got super excited and were like, oh my gosh, what do you do? And they like to tell their stories about going to football games and other athletic events. And so I think the family aspect really does radiate outside of just within athletics or within the college. Thank you. I have a, being from Manhattan, Kansas, I have a total different feel about that question. Um, Kansas State University is, is, a, is, is, a, is education. And when I look at uh, Kansas State versus the uh, community, it's two communities. When uh, I've often said this, when you cross Anderson Avenue and you're on this campus, you're in another world. And the university will never be what the community is. They're, they're just different. And, uh, but Manhattan community as a whole is a beautiful place to be. But this university is a different place. So, my feelings are when you're on this campus, you're in a different town. And uh, that's a good thing, but, uh, but there's a big difference between being on campus and just being in, in, in the community in general. And a lot of the people that enter the community, they don't feel comfortable sometimes even coming up on this campus because it's different. And so um, I, I just think that uh, with the two being here t together, which K-State's been here forever, uh, you, you have to be here to understand and feel that. And, uh, but there is a difference between the community and this university. Yeah, I think that the university does such a good job of diversity and inclusion and unity that sometimes the external community can um, look a little bit segregated in comparison to Kansas State. But I think that um, the majority of people that leave this university or that have come through here um, are definitely changed and impacted for the better. And I think that, um, at least myself and my teammates, I think that we uh, take that diversity and inclusion and spread that into the community around. And I think that, um, that that needs to be a shared experience of everyone that steps on foot on this campus that um, we accept and celebrate each other's differences, so that way we can um, uplift our community around us. Oh, 
I agree with both of your points. I just had a quick question. What were the major differences that you feel that are different from campus and not? Well, I just think the people that live in this community are, are not on this campus and around the things that go on here every day, and, and it's, it's, it's totally a different world. Um, and I think you'll find this in all major colleges, uh, um, communities that have a major college. Uh, a university is just a different place than the general population. Now that's not a bad thing, but I'm just saying people in, the, in this community in general are not around the things that go on on this campus each and every day. And uh, now I will say this, Manhattan does a beautiful job of embracing Kent State University. I mean, everything's purple here. Uh, I remember when I was coaching here, there used to be, uh, you went to the grocery store and you could buy a loaf of bread in purple wrappers. <laughs> and and so, so the community definitely supports this community, but there's a lot of people here that don't feel comfortable coming up on this campus because it's, it's just a different place. Interesting. I, I, I really enjoy hearing different perspectives because I'm able, me personally, I'm able to work like with athletics on campus and a little bit of off campus and just to hear different perspectives is very, very interesting because you don't really just seek for different perspectives. You just don't see it. You don't feel it or anything. So I'm glad to hear some new understandings. I want to uh, touch upon something that Mr. Baker said and then some of the rest of you. How do you know when you belong? I'm looking at the panel. Most of us have natural hair. Some of you are familiar with um, the Crown Act. The Crown Act was created so that women of color, people of color, men of color, non-binary persons of color, so that they can go into their place of employment and be comfortable and taken seriously and apply for a job and be taken seriously and even receive a job offer. So if you're not familiar with the Crown Act, please, that's your research, that, that is your uh, assignment to go home and Google the Crown Act. And so I want to get back to the question, how do you know that you belong here at Kansas State University? What is it that you can provide us as an example to let us know that you feel that sense of belonging. You don't have to change who you are. You can show up as your authentic self with braids, with, with natural hair like myself, uh, with tattoos, with body piercings, nose piercings, brown skin, beige skin, white skin. How do you know that you belong? I like that question. I would say this, as a minority, I don't care where you go, where you, when you go into a grocery store, when you go into a um, eating establishment, when you walk in, you will know whether or not you're welcome or not. And so the atmosphere that you go into will tell you whether or not you're welcome. And if you feel welcome, you'll feel good. If you're not welcome, you probably won't stay. And that's very true, not only here at the university, but in town or any place where you go. So as a person, as an individual, you know when you walk in a place whether or not you're welcome or not. You will have that feeling. And if you don't have that feeling, uh, then you don't, you don't know. But I know in Manhattan, Kansas, for me, I, I've always been able to go pretty much wherever I wanted to go and, and feel okay. But there are some places where you go where you know you're not okay. And so it's a gut feeling. And so that's easy. Born in Mississippi, I know the feeling of not being welcome. And uh, at Kansas State University, I think that one when, will know when they are welcome because people are welcoming. You know, when you go into a place and someone says good morning to you, they don't shun you, they accept what you have to say and they listen, more than likely you'll know that you're welcome. However, if 
something else happens where you go into a place you're ignored, no one ever speaks to you, you are treated like an outcast, then you know that you're not welcome. So having been here for so many years, I've encountered mostly 99% of being welcome, but in some instances, I felt a little unwelcome here or there. But because um, me being the person that I am, I'll say something and I'll be the first one sometimes to say good morning or how are you doing, where, what is your name, where are you from? And if it's shunned, I'll note that and keep on moving. Um, I feel like growing up, I always grew up with a mentality. Well, first and foremost, where I'm from, um, Mission, Texas. I don't know if y'all are familiar with that, but it's down south in the valley. Um, my family and I, my sisters and I, we were the only black family there. Um, in like the whole area. And then on top of that, we were the only African family. Um, we originate from Cameroon, it's in West Africa. And so um, my mom always instilled in us, be the light wherever you go. Um, even if people you know, don't like you, don't include you, make sure you like yourself first and foremost, make sure you love yourself first and foremost, and you will shine wherever you go. So that's just something that has been instilled, literally engraved in me from when I was born, so. And then just having mentors and people to look up to, I've always just grown confident in that aspect and just going anywhere, yeah, there's some places where I don't feel welcome, but I know that I welcome myself. So I guess in a sense, I'm not intimidated, like I could walk into any room and know that I will still be that light because if I'm my best self, then I'm gonna be the light in the room. So being, um, <laughs> Unwelcome hasn't really been an issue for me. Yeah, there's some instances, but I know like I'm doing my best and if you know they don't want to welcome me, that's on them. So, yeah. I guess I'll go. Okay. Um so for me, how I feel welcomed here at Kansas State University, um I think it goes off of what Ms. Vera said as well. Um it's how like how you're being welcomed, you know, and it's a, it's a feeling, but it's also interactions. I personally go not only based off of your first impression, not only your first interaction with someone. I go based off of how someone treats you every day, how you're treated, you know, in the worst day of the week, Wednesday, you know, when you're just tired and don't want to be at work, you know, just how are you being welcomed into those spaces every day and not just oh, when you first get here, you know what I mean? Um, personally, I feel like I am welcomed here at Kansas State University. In most spaces, there are instances where it's a little hit or miss, but you know, those days, like Daisy said, you be the light in the room. If you don't feel welcomed, you welcome yourself into those spaces. Right. So. <laughs> Thank you. Let's pivot just a little. What do you believe, let's put on our athletic cap now. What do you believe is the biggest misperception of athletes? Um, I think being on campus now more um, with uh, my teaching position, it's definitely that we are athlete students, that we cheat on all of our homework, that we don't know how to read, um, all, all the silly things like that. Um, and I feel like I've kind of seen some of that, uh, those stereotypes when working on group projects or even going and talking to professors or even when I was interviewing for the position um, that I'm in now, you know, it, there's a lot of, uh, judgment um, and just a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings, but I think uh, in athletics, especially the support staff that we have, um, the Evans Competitive Advantage Program, like all the opportunities that we have here in athletics, I think definitely help um, 
build us up as student athletes, students first. Um, we have so many resources that are available to us um, that they're, that I think that when we go on campus, when we uh, go to class, I think that um, we are very well represented um, education wise. I think that we have so many resources and, and we are very smart. I think that um, we should not be counted out in the classroom for sure. Ooh -wee. The biggest misconception that I've encountered is time. We are always deemed as we never have time for anything. We never have time for ourselves. We don't have time to get involved. I, I don't want to toot my horn, but I was able to get involved and still have plenty of time for a track and field. I am a firm believer of you make time for things that you care about. You make time for things that you want. You know what I mean? So I was able to make time to go to BSU on Tuesdays, you know, go get involved with my sorority, go to AIA and get involved with my faith and, you know, meet with Andre and, you know, grow in my leadership. I was able to do all of that. So the time is just the biggest misconception because like I said, you make time for what you care about. And with track, obviously it takes up more time than you think. Um, but at the end of the day, there's plenty of time for what you want to do and what you want to accomplish. It's just also time management, so. Yeah. Okay, um, I feel like with being a, an athlete, there's a lot of stereotypes that come with it. I mean, Bree took it out of my mouth like, oh, you know, athletes just get spoon fed and athletes aren't smart. Um, as an athlete myself, I'm proud to say that I have a 4.0 right now. I'm proud to say that um, hopefully by the end of the semester, I'll be on the dean's list and I spend a lot of time studying. So it's like, I don't know why there's a common misconception, but it's there and it needs to be broken because before we're able to do our sport and represent the school, it's no pass, no play. That's a rule all across the board. If you don't pass, if you don't um, represent yourself well in the classroom, you're not traveling. You're not getting on the plane to a travel meet. You're not competing. That's just set in stone. So um, being an athlete, yeah, there's a higher standard because you know we represent the school, we represent ourselves, we represent our community, but we're smart, you know? And then another thing is like, People have come up to me and been like, oh my goodness, like, you're actually nice or you're actually talking like, I'm a person, of course, of course I'm gonna talk to you. So like, I think a lot of people think, oh, you know, they're j they just stick to themselves, they just are athletes, that's it, we can't talk to them. You guys can talk to us, we are people, we were born in the same world that y'all were born. So it's just, I feel like it's a common misconception. I feel like as we represent ourselves more on campus and do events like this, people are starting to realize like, hey, like, you know, we can go talk to them. We can go, you know, fellowship with them. We can create a community with them as well. So, Working with the social media team, we see a lot of what people say about the athletes on social media, and it's very night and day. So when they're having a good game or good event, they'll praise them, say, you're so good, all of this. But then when they have one bad game, one bad play, then it's some very nasty things that are said out there. Um, and I think it's important to remember that these kids that are out here, sorry, you guys are kids, but um, they are 18 to 22 years old and that they have lives, they're human, and that they can see the things that people say about them online and it hurts just as much as if they were saying about me or any one of you. Um, so I think that's the biggest misconception is that they're just there for their game and they don't live lives outside of what happens on the field or track or anything like that. I'm gonna praise the athletics. athletics. I think most people have no idea about how hard and how difficult it is to participate in college sports today. Um, not only just the sport itself, but going to school, uh, the class, the whole works. It's more than, it's a 24 seven job. People don't realize that. And for, I won't call it a mis misperception, but I think people do not understand how difficult it is to participate 
in college athletics today with, with what we see. And uh, so uh, whenever you think that they're not doing what you think they ought to be doing, put yourself in their shoes and you, 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 will, you will know what we're talking about. But we are special people because we have a special talent. But everybody's special. Everybody has a special talent. Ours just happens to be athletics. But it is a very difficult thing to do today. These young folks do it today because they're talented and, and, and they're capable. But I think the general public has no idea. It's a 24-7 job. And, uh, and I really appreciate what they're able to accomplish. Thank you. We have heard the word resources used several times. Can you talk a little about the resources that you utilize, our resources that might need to be implemented at Kansas State University? From a DEIB perspective, what resources are currently available, and then where is there a gap in order to help you be successful? Do you want this in an athletic standpoint or campus? Oh, okay. Um, I'll start with athletics. So there are, I can't even count on my hands how many affinity groups that, that we have in athletics, whether it's, um, what is it, AIA, which is our Christian faith group. There's PALS, which is Positioning African Americans for Life, African American Student Athletes for Lifelong Success. There's LGBTQ groups, there's so many resources within athletics, and I don't, and personally, I would not be here without those affinity groups, with like encouraging us and uplifting us mentally, physically, and socially to create a community within athletics. Um, as far as creating new ones, I don't think there are, there really should be any new ones. I think there should be more of an emphasis on the ones that are here, more of you know, resources towards them, pushing, not pushing, I guess, encouraging athletes to come to these groups, to making sure that we're using our resources because they are available. It's just hard. Sometimes you get so wrapped up into what our sport is, you don't know how much that you may benefit from them. So. Okay, so I feel like something that makes K-State stand out to a lot of different universities or from personal experience from my last university is that the amount of resources. I always say like, oh my goodness, like there's something for everyone here on campus, starting with groups. There's a club, there's an org, there's a group for everyone on campus, whether you like to draw, whether you like to write, whether you want to be a poet, whether whatever you want to do, there's a group for you. And I feel like that's a resource in its own and you're able to find a community within. Another thing, our Hell Library is crazy. Like, I um, recently took a tour with my class, one of my professors, we took a tour, and I was like, wow, like, this is here for free for our students, for us. Like, they're doing this, and we're able to use all of these resources. I mean, there's a 3D printer in there, there's a studio in there, there's a lab, you can make music, there's a big theater, like just places where you can showcase and represent yourself. If you, you know, are a theater major and you are interested in films, you can go in there and make a film. You can, you know, there's just things for everyone and on campus that's not only for athletes, but that's for students, staff, faculty, everybody as a whole. So I feel like um, just K-State in general, I appreciate that about K-State because there are a lot of resources and also like the people, a lot of, you know, older people and professors that I have met, every time I meet them, they give me their card. Hey, you know, call me if you need anything. Stop by my office. It's in this building if you need anything. That's a resource in its own. And the fact that, and I think that also goes back to people being welcoming and just wanting to see you succeed. People here are genuinely for you. And I think that is my favorite thing about K-State. Um, I agree with both Mo and Daisy that and I spoke on it earlier, we have so many resources and opportunities to be successful um, in athletics and all the different groups that we have. Um, one thing that I have um, struggled with is a lot of the on-campus resources are right in the middle of practice times or treatment or meetings or whatever it is. 
um, there's so many amazing opportunities that K-State um, provides its students with, but it's, it's really difficult for us to make those. Um, it's been a little bit better with things being recorded and being on Zoom, um, but you know, just office hours and, and there, I can't even count the amount of things that, I, that a professor has said, if you need help, come to this, or for career opportunities, come to this, and it's like, I can't, like I have practice. Um, and that also perpetuates the stereotypes that we talked about earlier about how we are just athletes, we, we only do practice meetings, treatment, lift, et cetera. Um, but it is hard, and like Mo said, there is time management that's involved with it, but there are just a lot of um, opportunities that we have to miss because of competition and, and whatnot. But I think that athletics does a good job of making up for that by providing us um, career resources in veneer, um, but that is something that I would like to see, and, and I don't have the answer for it. You know, I know not, times aren't gonna work for everybody, but um, I would like to see professors or maybe on campus uh, staff just being a little bit more flexible or, or being willing to help out when, when I can't make something due to a practice or athletic related event. I would like to commend Dr. Johnson for this program today. Um, this is very, very special to me. I was here in the 70s and we had nothing like this. And so if there were more programs like this, I've learned a lot today just from these young folks that are, that are here today. And, uh, but if there were more programs like this, I think this would definitely be another avenue to get to learn more about diversity, the things that we've talked about today. And, um, Matter of fact, I think this is the first one of these. Am I correct on that? First one. Andre, is this the first like this? First program of this nature? Second, okay. But, but I think these, these programs are very helpful in helping us all learn. So I'd like I, to say oh, something no, really quickly. Um, I think that athletics does a great job in offering programming within the last four or five years because um, with the um, incorporation or the start up of DEIB programming, it has made a difference. And what I like about it most is that with the PALS program, the Global CATS, if there is an issue, the students have an opportunity to talk about them with that platform and they can speak up as to what is missing or what needs to be incorporated or what needs to be added, whereas in the past, those programs were not in existence. So I think just having those programs on board make, make a difference and it offers opportunities to explore the things that need to be explored if there is something missing or something that can be enhanced or something that can be added or even subtracted. And finally, what DEIB closing remarks or comments would you like to share with our audience that you've always wanted to say, but you never had an opportunity to do so? This is your opportunity. I'll say something. I think that in the athletics department, um, we have some diversity, uh, but I think that we need to work on incorporating more persons of color, more uh, LGBT, more people from different ethnicities and orientations, so we can have more input from people on outside who don't look like us. I mean, me myself being an older African American person, um, there's probably no one in the building that is within my age range as far as being African-American black female. So I don't have to have anybody there, but it would be nice to be able to talk to somebody about some things sometimes, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I'm just saying that, but if you are, just say for example, in this room, if you were the only African-American, I mean only white person 
in this whole room, how would you feel? Every day you come to work and nobody looks like you. How would that make you feel? Nobody to share your thoughts, your culture, your ideas. You know, you, they're uh, who's used to sharing those types of things. So just think about that sometimes when you walk into a room and nobody looks like you. I'll piggyback off of Ms. Vera. Um, right now, K-State Athletics doesn't have any women head coaches, um, including of any of the women's sports. Um, and I think that's important for uh, the young ladies who are competing to have someone to look up to and say, oh, I can coach. And whether it, instead of thinking that it's just a male dominated field, um, but to start there. And then um, another thing I wanted to add is that people think that DEIB stuff has to be this grand gesture or something that's super big, but really it doesn't have to be anything big. It can start small um, and then work its way up. Um, <laughs> I guess for closing remarks for me, um, to piggyback off of what Ms. Vera said, um, you know, going into our compliance office, going into veneer every day, seeing just Ms. Vera, Andre, Regina, like it's, it's very, very interesting as a black athlete to walk into these spaces and like, wow, I mean, you know, you would like to see a little bit more people who look like you in those spaces. Um, but like she said, you know, it starts with little things and working your way up to those points. Um, and it's also a closing remark. I know it's nice to get together and hear all of our perspectives and everything, but it is also important to make action after hearing our feedback, after hearing our perspective, after hearing what we have to say, you know, putting action towards making some, some of these changes or listening to what, what we can do better moving forward for the younger athletes, for, you know, athletes who are here or whatever, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I feel like just to piggyback off of what Ms. Vieira said, um, you know, earlier I talked about how there's, you know, there's a space for everyone, you know, whatever you like to do, there's a space for you. And I know there's always room for improvement. So I personally think that K-State is doing a good job compared to, you know, what he said. He said that it's changed over the years and change is growth. So I feel like if we continue to change, if we continue to put a plan to action, I feel like, you know, we'll be a powerhouse. So um, just specifically, I guess I would love to see more you know, black, black faces, more people, you know, LGBTQ and plus community, just people for everyone, because you never know, you know, what somebody is going through and you always want to connect to somebody that's, you know, similar to you, whether it's the way you look, whether it's your religion, whether it's your gender, how you identify. So just to change in that aspect and, you know, whether it's hire people or just involve people in the K-State community that fit those descriptions. But change is growth and I feel like as we keep changing over the years and over the time and you know that will come and one more thing I want to say is that um, the people here are great they're good people and although you might not represent my race or any other person's race just keep on doing good things and welcoming people and making them feel important I think that being in a, in a in the compliance office, I feel personally that it's my job to make everybody feel welcome. It doesn't matter what race they are, what nationality they are, what country they came from, it's always good to just welcome them and make them feel like we are the best athletics department in the world. So I think if we just keep doing that for any person, age, race, uh, color, uh, sexual orientation, we're doing a great thing. Thank you all. Please help me to thank our phenomenal and extraordinary panelists today. And finally or lastly, I would like to thank the person that put this all together. Please help me to welcome 
Andre Bean. Um, as I have a question. As Andre is coming up, are there any questions for us? Oh, yes. Any questions for? <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Um, well, and I'm just curious about the Bible study. Um, and actually, a little bit of a comment. Thank you. Um, I heard the word minority, and I would like to urge everyone in this room to stop using that term. There's nothing minor about our identities. We have been minoritized, and I want to remind you that your phenotypes are the global majority. We've only been minoritized in, in, in this um, colonial settler history. So that's something, but I loved what Daisy said about be the light wherever you go, and that's who we should be focusing on and never accept minority, because we're not. Thank you for your wonderful words that you said today. Thank you. All right, well, if we have no other questions, one more chance. Speak now or forever. We're oh, open we books. <laughs> I, I'm curious, actually, Mr. Baker, you've been here, you know, back in the 70s in K-State, and you're, you're here, you're, you're director of the Douglas Center, right? Oh, you retired. Okay, congratulations. <laughs> but I'm curious, if you, could you make a comparison to how, um, I guess I would say, the culture in athletics or in K-State back when you were a student and now, you know, uh, what are some major changes you've observed in, in even in terms of climate or the, the feeling of belonging or inclusion? There is no comparison. It was, it was very difficult, different back in those days. Um, Manhattan, uh, is when I grew up here, was, was very segregated. And uh, that change probably uh, started to change in the 70s. Uh, actually changed a lot after I left. I left here in 84. But prior to that, uh, Manhattan was very, still, still segregated. And uh, so, so times have really changed, and, and, and for the better. So uh, to answer your question, that's, that's easy. It, 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 was, it was difficult back then. When I grew up here uh, as a youngster, you know, K-State athletics couldn't stay on this campus. And so, so a lot of things have changed in time. And so, yeah. Oh, I just have a question with social media. With us being baby boomers, I mean, we had to talk. And a lot of times it's hard to get young people to talk. I mean, you can go all day texting, you can go all day saying what you gotta say on Facebook, and then when we get face to face, it's like, hello, hey, hey. And it's hard for us to communicate that way. So how can, as young people, you can pull back a little bit and enjoy the memories of being in the space instead of always shooting it out to social media. I've been next to people and they're like, a oh, text me. I'm like, I'm standing right here. Yeah. I, I, you've seen that, right? I've seen people, we're gonna hang out and everybody's on their phone. So I'm trying to figure out what that hangout means that when we're in a room or at a party or something back in the day, girl, we sweating our hair out. But you guys were just kinda like, uh, yeah. So, how can we bridge that of getting people to talk to us? So um, I didn't say this earlier, but I think one of the negative sides of social media for sure is that lag in communication, that communication gap that we have, because there's not a lot of representation on social media of people that aren't like you because your feed is filled with people that look just like you or are into, interested in whatever you are. Um, and there's also not a lot of older adults on social media. Um, and so the way that I um, go about that is I am all about intergenerational relationships. Having 
relationships and friendships with people um, that are older than you, younger than you, are just as important as the friendships that you have with people that are the same age as you. Um, and to answer your question, I think um, we get better at communication the more we communicate with people. So being able to communicate with older adults for me um, has definitely um, positively impacted my communication abilities because older adults aren't wanting to sit and text you. They want to talk with you face to face. Um, they want to interact, create memories, bonds, um, things that bind you together to other people um, do not happen over your phone. And so for me, I think creating relationships that are intergenerational with people that were born 50, 60 years before I was are so important to help bridge that gap in communication and create those memories and things that last a lifetime um, are not gonna be on your phone and on social media. All right, well, thank you all for attending this afternoon session. Yeah, let's give one more round of applause. Thank you to the panelists for sharing your, your thoughts and, and being vulnerable and transparent with us this afternoon. Um, in closing, before I pass it to Ms. Sarah here so we can do the raffle, so everyone check, grab that um, if you have it. Um, I do wanna leave you all with some of the things that some of our student athletes mentioned. Um, and when we meet from the Evans Competitive Advantage Department, we talk about goal setting. Um, and we are trying to develop our athletes into being human beings after sport, whenever that ends for them. But that's one of the things that we talk about that Monique mentioned, um, action, right? So I do challenge each and every one of you to uh, take in everything that they said. I know some things may be a little uncomfortable, but that's fine, right? That's life, so, um, but the most thing that I want everyone to take from this, and I challenge you all, is to uh, incorporate that action into your departments, into uh, any students, into any student athletes, into your families, right? Because with that, that's how we could be the best versions of ourselves. And we are all here, again, to Dr. Johnson's point, is to KS Unite. 